VMR, aka RLR, Robbie loves Reza. And it's always in that direction, not the other direction. Um, it's nice to see all of you, very excited. Let me uh, just first start by asking, does anyone have a case for today that they want to present to Robbie and me? Remember, on Fridays, we co-discuss, so it's not with a learner, but we would love a learner to volunteer to present a case. Uh, so please include it in the chat, and I'll ask Rafa or Maria to keep an eye out for a case volunteer and to let us know if anyone has a case. Uh, in the meantime, we have someone who's scribing for the first time from Peru, and I'm going to ask Valeria to unmute herself and just introduce herself to the community. And I just want to say how uh, lucky we are to have you join our, our team and very excited to get to know you, Valeria. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa. Uh, yes, uh, hello everyone. I am Valeria, I am from Peru. And it's my first time describing. I'm super excited to work with the team and catch the case of today. Hopefully it's gonna be a good one and I'm really sure the discussion is gonna be amazing. So yeah, really excited to see you all today. Welcome, Valeria. You're getting a lot of love from people in the chat, um, which is terrific. And as a reminder, Robbie will be joining us shortly. And I see Kiara has made it too. Hi, Kiara. Uh, Kiara is going to be teaching today, which is wonderful. Um, as a reminder, we need a volunteer to present a case. Um, so please, if you have a case, volunteer. In the meantime, let me present y'all a case to get you engaged a bit, but I don't want you to be distracted by my case. I really want someone to volunteer. The mathematician should be here in five to uh, 10 minutes, but uh, please, um, Rafa and Maria, keep an eye out on the chat, okay? All right, can you guys see my screen? Do you guys see the back of, of legs? Yes, thank you, Rafa. So, um, a friend of mine sent me a picture of the back of her legs and you'll see the top part is before she got treated. Maybe in the chat, you can type, what are you seeing here? What's this pattern described as? What's this pattern described as? And then this is post-treatment. And let me know if you have any, what kind of questions do you have about this? Uh, sorry, Gurbani, I can't zoom in. I, I barely can show it on this Word document. <laughs> Let me, yes, it is reticulated. So these, this is net-like. This is a net-like rash on the back of the legs. Uh, it's levito-like. Yes, Kirtan, beautiful. This is levito reticularis. Reticularis just literally means net-like. Levito means blue. And... Um, Generally, you'll see this rash when you have less blood flow to the arterioles and they sort of show you the shape of how the arterioles perfuse the skin. So what can lead to this um, is some form of vasculopathy. So if you have APLS, if you have lupus, if you have hyperviscosity, um, if you have type one cryoglobulinemia, now, let me tell you this about this person who sent me the picture. She does not have, she's 25 years old, doesn't have joint pain, doesn't have fever, uh, has no symptoms. In fact, is healing healthier than she's ever felt running four miles a day. Maybe someone can convert that into kilometers for, for the international audience. Sorry for using miles. Um, Yes, uh, Nilayan, I had uh, recommended a derm consult biopsy, but my recommendation was wrong. What a uh, 2.5, thank you, Andrew, 2.5 kilometers. So what can mimic levito reticularis? What question do you have for this patient? So again, no complaints whatsoever. I'm sure someone in the audience knows what can mimic Levito reticularis, what questions do you have for the patient? Ravi, <laughs> unmute yourself. Are you in a place where you can unmute yourself? Ravi. Hey, Reza, how are you? 
How are you, my friend? Where? Let me see. Where am I seeing your face? Or can you? Um, you asked about hot packs. Can you tell? Can you tell the audience why? Yeah, I think um, we had a student here that uh, presented a poster at the ACP Maryland um, meeting where somebody was using hot packs, and actually they developed this skin rash. So it looked very like it looked pretty bothersome and. Um, very peculiar, but it ended up being attributed to, to the hot packs. So first of all, thank you so much, Ravi. I always love hearing your voice. You just, you sound smart, but it's not only because of your accent, you actually are smart. Um, Anne-Marie is, is really uh, loving the picture of, of your doodle. It lo it lo I don't know if it's a mix or not. I, I won't try to, I won't try a diagnostic challenge uh, with the dog that you have, but Ravi is 100% correct. I asked, so I, I didn't know about erythema ab igne, which is red from fire. I was at um, at noon conference with Gurpreet Dhaliwal. I said, Gurpreet, like I'm recommending a skin biopsy, ANA, double-stranded DNA complements. He's like, Reza, have you considered the mimicker of levito reticularis, erythema ab igne? I was like, erythema what? Ab igne is what Gurpreet said. So I asked this friend of mine, have you been applying heating pads? And for the past month, since she started running, she started applying heating packs to the back of her legs. So what was the treatment? Stop applying the heating pads. And within a month, actually within a week, her rash completely resolved. So thank you, Ravi. Um, that was a little mini case for, for you all. And, and that's, you know, I think this highlights the power of the crowd. There's always someone in the crowd that knows the answer her. So if you are a teaching physician, make sure to fight against this hierarchy, empower everyone to share their thinking. Because it's when you empower everyone that you get the best result from the team. And so if we were on rounds, um, Ravi would have helped us reach the diagnosis. All right, so I'm gonna mute myself now. I think I've spoken enough. Let's see um, if someone has a case to present today. I wish we, we need to get some like uh, standby music while we're waiting. So it's not silent. All right, Rafa, please unmute yourself, my friend. I think- Hi everyone, um, um, my name is Rafael. I'm also a CP Service team member. I've read this case that I really enjoyed through the Human Jacks app. It's a very wonderful app that I think everyone should try to read and study. I've learned so much and I think everyone can um, enjoy the same opportunity. Awesome, Rafa, thanks for volunteering. I'm very excited. Um, maybe Valeria can take over the screen to start scribing. And Rafa, if you don't mind, just uh, present it slowly, please. And um, let's have some fun. Yes, I've, I've been there, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is a case that was um, presented by Nikita, our friend, actually, I know her, and she's from Georgetown University School of Medicine. So this is a patient that presented a 39-year-old female that presented with fatigue. Um, do you want more information, Reza? Yeah, and maybe I'll just give a quick teaching point. Um, fatigue, in general, it's not a helpful, you know, chief concern to invest your cognitive energy because anything under the sun can cause fatigue. So it doesn't really help the diagnostician make much progress. So we're going to have to look for associated symptoms before 
we can actually share a relevant DDX. But I think that's an important teaching point. So ignore the fatigue. Let, let's see what else is going on with this patient. Okay, so the fatigue started seven weeks ago and has progressively worsened. <laughs> worsened. Sorry, Rafa, Andrew and says even weeks... the sun can cause fatigue. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, so four weeks ago, she began to experience severe pruritus throughout the day. And mm -hmm, severe pruritus throughout the day. And uh, this morning, her eyes turned yellow, which prompted her to present to the hospital. Um, this patient also reported intermittent night sweats and 10 pounds of unintentional weight loss. Since her symptoms began, and that's the end of adequate number one. Thank you, Rafa. Wow, you, ha did you have me at the edge of my seat, my friend. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. And here we have a lot of data to work with, okay? And um, as I describe my thinking, uh, someone please let me know when Robbie uh, joins so I can get the mathematician involved. Oh, oh my gosh. The, oh. Robbie, I almost had a loss of consciousness. I didn't know how I was gonna tackle this without you, my friend. Look at that, look at that. We combined forces yet again on this lovely Friday. How are you, Robbie? I'm doing very well. Are you wearing your Hopkins jersey at Northwestern? <laughs> and I, and I, yes, I am. <laughs> Amazing! Look at that, folks. <laughs> uh, every Friday, we we wear the Hopkins uh, the gear. Oh, that's, um, that's right. That's right. That's it's, it's our tradition. So it's no, it, it's not anything against Northwestern by any means. I love Northwestern. Uh, Robbie, so just to let you know, Valeria is scribing for the first time today. Ooh. Rafa is presenting a case from, uh -oh. from Human DX. We just started, it's a 39 year old um, woman with fatigue, pruritus, scleral icterus, night sweats and weight loss, subacute course. So okay. I'm gonna just tackle the pruritus and then I'm gonna leave everything else as I always did to Ravi. All right. All right, so of course, you know, we, we've highlighted the problem representation many times on CP solvers and it's critical. The age of the patient allows you to prioritize the DDX that you create. Pruritus, unlike fatigue, is a unique finder and can be the center of gravity of a case. Although in this specific case, there's other interesting findings that weren't thought that Robbie will tackle. So pruritus, itchiness, what can cause it? Well, first you have to think about primary skin pathology. So dry skin, eczema, scabies, these are common causes of pruritus, common cause of pruritus. So if someone says they have pruritus, I first look at the skin. You have to be cautious here because as the person is scratching themselves, they may have secondary changes due to the physical trauma from scratching. But step one, are we dealing with the primary skin disorder, apply base rate of disease, dry skin, eczema, for example, and in the right population, scabies, don't forget it, that can be very easy to miss. But once you know that this pruritus has been going on for seven weeks, you gotta go beyond the base rate of disease you have to start considering causes of chronic pruritus in systemic diseases. So then the question becomes, what types of systemic diseases can lead to pruritus? Think about organs. So if you have renal failure and uremia, you can get pruritus. Liver failure or liver injury, specifically cholestasis, not hyperbilirubinemia, but cholestasis, Something about the bile salts depositing in the skin, and I know Maria will like this, triggering nerves, sensory nerves to send a signal to the sensory cortex. 
And that's the extent of my neurology knowledge, folks. So, so liver in the form of cholestasis, kidney injury in the form of uremia, but also systemic diseases like lymphoma. Lymphoma particularly can result in pruritus. Um, and thyroid abnormality. So thyroid, liver, kidney, malignancy. Having said that, I'd love to pass the, the mic to Robbie because I think the other elements may allow us to even make more progress than what I laid out. I mean, absolutely brilliant, brilliant. I have one uh, prop. I usually, I don't really, ha I really have props in my reflections or teachings. This is my prop. <coughs> hey, Maria. Good morning. Hi, is that a carrot? <laughs> Pop quiz. No. Why? Okay. Yes. yes. Oh, look, y'all. I'm turning, John. I'm literally, I'm having so many carrots. I'm turning yellow. <laughs> but how do we know that this, you can't teach and eat at the same time. It's really hard. How do you know this patient does not have beta carotenemia as the cause of their yellowing of their skin because of eating all these carrots? It's because her eyes are turning yellow. Beta, yes, prop res. Look at those beautiful eyes. And yes, I am flirting with you on this lovely Friday. Um, so this patient has hyperbilirubinemia as the sole cause of the pigment changes in her skin because it's affecting her eyes. Um, I can't eat anymore, can't teach. So we really have to start, start to make progress on, we know the bilirubin is elevated. And the question is, is it direct or indirect? There are many clues to help you prioritize one over the other, but you should always go to the lab because when you have the lab, you don't need the clues, you have the definitive answer. But if you're trying to predict the lab, the most specific thing to hepatic involvement here is the pruritus, as Reza alluded to. So the pruritus prioritizes direct hyperbilirubinemia, and so we are likely in the world of direct hyperbilirubinemia. Direct hyperbilirubinemia is no different than kidney issues causing an elevated creatinine. Is it a problem in the kidney itself or the liver itself in the case of direct bilirubin, or is it a problem in the plumbing that excretes the, the product? In this case, direct bilirubin in the kidneys pays, case creatinine. How do we look for um, uh, the plumbing issue in the kidney? We get an ultrasound to look for hydronephrosis. And here we must wonder, we will need an ultrasound to look for the bladder, for the, for the um, biliary equivalent of hydronephrosis. So the key question is, is this post obstructive Colist, uh, direct hyperbilirubinemia, or is this intrahepatic hyperbilirubinemia? That's the key question. There's no way to know for sure. No way to know for sure. So the next key question is, this is likely cholestasis, likely direct hyperbilirubinemia. I don't know what's going on in the chat, but there's something going on in the chat. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take a look in a minute. I'll take a look in a minute. This person has direct hyperbilirubinemia with very high certainty. The question is, is it post-hepatic in the biliary tree or is it intrahepatic? And we'll need the, the labs to make more progress. Um, but the key question now is, does this patient have the um, gallbladder equivalent of hydro or not? And if, if she does, the answer is in analyzing what's causing obstruction. If she doesn't, then the answer is what's going on in the liver. All right, I'll pass the mic back to Rafa. So past medical history, this patient uh, says that she had hepatitis A as a child in Venezuela. Uh, there is no family history, significant family history. And past surgical history, she had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy more than 10 years ago. Um, when it comes to medications, I'm sorry, but I, I, I've never um, read this before. It's your serine. I'm going to type on the chat. I don't know what medication is that. Your serine. And also workout supplements, BCAA, and hydroxycut. Oh, it's a lotion, good to know. Um, travel history, uh, she recently traveled to Bangladesh, Switzerland, 
in Mexico in the last three months. And she works as a consultant. Uh, when it comes to the physical exam, her temperature is 37.2. Her heart rate is 66, respiratory rate 16, and blood pressure 127 over 81. And she's saturating 98% on room air. On general exam, she's not she's using no acute distress. Uh, her HEENT exam shows icteric conjunctiva. Her lungs are clear on auscultation bilaterally. Um, her cardiovascular exam, there it's normal with no pedal edema. Um, when it comes to her abdomen, it's soft, non-tender, non-distended, and she has hepatomegaly. And that's the end of the aliquot number two. Somebody on Patreon, um, who I don't know, I feel for the sake of their privacy, we'll leave them unnamed, says that they um, uh, listen to RLR and fall asleep because it's soothing. Um, and have you guys listening to Rafa right now? He's just like presenting like he's singing a song. <laughs> so slowly and deliberately. And I'm having my carrots. And I'm just having a great time. Thank you, Rafa, for your... Epic delivery of this presentation. Oh, I, I, I'm keeping up with Valeria. It's her first time in the. I know. Yeah, yeah, thoughtful. <laughs> so incredibly thoughtful. Thank you. Um, I will do the background and leave the foreground for Prof. Rez. So there's a lot of hepatic history here. Um, a helpful way to understand the hepatitis viruses is to file them into which ones can cause acute and chronic disease. And hep A is almost always associated with acute disease. Um, but not always true. The vast majority of hepatitis A is symptomatic and causes mild acute liver injury, but can, in some cases, cause fulminant hepatitis. There are, however, two prolonged manifestations of hepatitis A. The first is recurrent cholestatic hepatitis A, where patients for up to six months after their um, initial illness have a cholestatic liver injury. Um, and there's a rebound hepatitis A in which patients can actually get better and then get worse again. So for the first six months, you actually can have a cholestatic disease related to hep A, but it's been way longer than that in this patient. This patient's cholecystectomy means that the surgeons have cured her of any possible gallstone disease, right? No. Surgery is never curative for anything, unfortunately. And it seems... Um, it seems like you, if you take out the gallbladder, gallstones are gone, but the gallstones can then form in the common bile duct, or you can actually get stones in the stump of the gallbladder. So the fact that she has a cholecystectomy does not leave her immune to um, stones. They're just not gallstones, they're common bile duct stones, and they tend to be bigger and potentially cause um, uh, extra hepatic obstruction. Medications are a common culprit for intrahepatic cholestasis. Parasites are a common culprit for extrahepatic cholestasis. Endemic mycoses and granulomatous diseases associated with travel are a common culprit for intrahepatic cholestasis. So to summarize, hep A can cause intrahepatic cholestasis if prolonged. Cholestectomy does not leave you to stone disease. Supplements can cause intrahepatic cholestasis. Granulomatous infections can cause intrahepatic cholestasis. Parasites like clonorchis, fasciola, ascariasis can cause extrahepatic cholestasis. We are going to dance between intra and extrahepatic with all these clues. The truth is none of it matters. You need to know where the lesion is and then start to make a DDX because all this data is compatible with one lesion or the other. So the real question, as Aaron always teaches us, localize the lesion first and then use the accompanying clues. So what did I, what did I just do here, do here? I did some practice for me to strengthen my neurons association with these conditions. But if you're taking care of this patient in real life, don't do this. Jump to localize the lesion first and then waste your uh, cognitive space on, don't waste your cognitive space, use your cognitive space wisely. So don't do what I just did in real life. But if you're practicing, strengthen those neurons. 
More in real life, you'd probably be studying this exam. And to that, uh, for that, I'll pass the mic to Prof Rez. Oh, that, that was absolute poetry. If um, Rafa is, is singing, you are doing something similar and singing. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think it's such an, like if you take one thing away from today's session is the importance of localizing the lesion, whether you're discussing neuroanatomy, renal injury, liver injury, localize the lesion. And I think this exam helps prioritize where this lesion might be. Now, what's important when someone comes in with jaundice, remember we're converting jaundice to hyperbil yellow eyes, jaundice, jaundice, hyperbilirubinemia, usually above three to be able to see sclerolecturis. It's important to consider cholangitis and acute liver failure. The same way when someone comes in with chest pain and we do the 422, um, with jaundice, you got to do the one, 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 acute liver failure, cholangitis, and hemolysis. <laughs> Robbie, what does that add up to? And are you smart? A grand total of nine because everything adds up to nine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, nothing about this is consistent with acute liver failure. Remember those patients present acutely encephalopathy, coagulopathy, acerixis, no, nothing is consistent with that. Cholangitis, nope, no fever, no right upper quadrant pain. So now you can relax. And you know the tempo isn't consistent with an acute process. How does this hepatomegaly help us? In general, um, one, it's tough to detect a, a liver. Like I wouldn't be able to tell you if someone has hepatomegaly unless it was striking. So I applaud the examiners for detecting this. One, this hepatomegaly could be a bystander and not relevant to the final diagnosis. For example, patients with fatty liver disease. But it's hard to ignore this enlarged liver in this context, in the context of cholestasis. So I am going to view the hepatomegaly as signal as if I seen the hepatomegaly on the CT scan. So when I'm trying to prioritize intrahepatic cholestasis, which includes viral etiologies, infiltrative etiologies, drug-related processes versus extrahepatic, which includes stones, sludge, primary sclerosing cholangitis, IgG4-related disease, um, HIV cholangiopathy, I am going to prioritize intrahepatic because of the hepatomegaly. In general, hepatomegaly can be from congestion, like heart failure, nothing to suggest heart failure here. It can be from inflammation, like we talked about viral hepatitides or an infiltrative process. I'm gonna prioritize infiltrative process causing intrahepatic cholestasis. When it comes to infiltrative processes, we just go back and I actually wanna give the mic back. Oh, Robbie's not there. We go back to what Robbie said. Oh, he is here. I want to give the mic back to Robbie because Robbie, I'm like ready to talk about some of these granulomatous processes that you alluded to based on the background information. It seems like the case we're making progress quickly. So I think we have time to talk about that, but what kind of granulomatous processes were you considering that can infiltrate the liver, make it enlarge, cause pruritus, and maybe related to the background information? Beautiful. Sorry, I dug into my bag to grab my apple which I don't associate with any disease. Let me know if that's true. Um, you know, I think of um, granulomatous processes um, by their source, because honestly, there's so many different granulomatous processes. So keeping track of them is very hard. And there are four sources where granulomatous diseases can come from. They can come from the skin, from the lungs, from the GI tract, and from the GU tract. And the common skin sources are Bartonella and sporotrichosis. The common lung sources are Mycobacteria, Nocardia, and Meliodosis. The common GI granulomatous diseases are Brucella, Salmonella, and Mycobacterium bovis. And the common GU, the, the most common GU source in the United States, bladder cancer, which we do uh, quite commonly here, and lymphogranuloma venerum. All those infections can originate at that site and then disseminate um, to the liver. So every single one of them is on the hook. 
I skipped over an important lung source and that's endemic mycoses. And that's where scrutinizing the, the background history is important because um, when you hear um, the combination of um, exposure to South Asia and um, North, uh, Central and South America, you wonder about the possible, the prioritized differential would be mycobacteria, brucella and salmonella typhi specifically. So all of those you'd have to think about. And the good news is you can study the origin. So you can study the lungs, the GI tract, or the skin for, for the portal of entry and subsequent dissemination to the liver. So the long, there's a long list of granulomatous diseases. So the question is, where did it come from? Skin, lung, GI, or GU? All right, back to you, Rafa. OK, they are far more eloquent, and I will combine them together, two adequates and then the other two. Okay, so uh, what will count? 5.9. Uh, the hemoglobin was 13.6. And the platelets were 319,000. The MCV was 93.3. 93.3. Okay, when it comes to her basic metabolic panel, the sodium was 138. The potassium was 3.8. The chloride was 104. The bicarb was uh, 27. The BUN was 9. The creatinine was 0.77. The glucose was 9H. The INR was 1. And the PTT was 28.6 seconds, which is normal. Her AST was 1,069, AST, 1,069. Her ALT was 1,274. Her total bill was 9.6, um, being the direct bill being 7.3. Her alkfos was 152, which is high. Her total protein was 8.2. And her albumin was three. Her urinalysis uh, showed urobilinogen, no white blood counts, no uh, red blood cells. And I'm gonna give you guys the imaging now. Her abdominal, abdominal, uh, abdominal ultrasound, sorry, with Doppler showed a status post cholecystectomy, patent hepatic vessels, with a normal direction of portal venous flow, diffuse hepatic steatosis without biliary ductal dilation. Diffuse hepatic steatosis without biliary ductal dilation and no suspicious hepatic lesions. And her MRI of the abdomen without contrast showed nodular liver contour may reflect early liver cirrhosis. And that's the end of the adequate. Wow. Rafa, what another rich aliquot of information. Um, what I'll do here is maybe I'll, I'll leave imaging for Robbie, but also I would love for him to add to any thoughts that I share with regard to the non-imaging data. Right away, you know, it, like to make this diagnosis of cirrhosis, you get clues on the history. The patient is confused on the physical exam, spidoangiomata, pulmonary erythema, caput medusae, 
nail findings. Um, these are all findings that may suggest cirrhosis. She had, this patient had none of those findings on physical exam. And then most importantly, look at the platelet count. The platelet count is just too high for cirrhosis. So I think that's an important exercise to go through. One thing to be, um, that the most striking data here is the AST and ALT. And um, I'll talk about that, but I'll tell you quickly, really what I did was I calculated an anion gap, which was seven, um, just thinking about paraproteinemias and their potential to infiltrate. But then I looked at the albumin and it's not, it's, it's within normal limits. It's within normal limits. Be cautious by saying that this creatinine is normal. Why? Because if you look at the, the BUN here, it's, it's a little low. And could this patient be malnourished? Could they have some muscle wasting and thereby the creatinine may not be an accurate reflection of what their true kidney function is? So it would be important to know what a prior creatinine is. That being said, Robbie teaches us that on day one, even if this patient has AKI, it's usually a victim of something else going on. Now let's, let's actually like talk about what's happening here. Whenever you're looking at liver chemistry tests, note, I didn't say liver function. Why? Because they're not really assessing the function. They're chemistry tests. And note, I didn't say transaminitis. Why? Robbie will tell you when he talks about the imaging why I didn't say transaminitis. But you want to categorize liver chemistry tests as hepatocellular, cholestatic, or mixed. Here, what's striking is this is predominantly hepatocellular. Yes, you do have a direct hyperbilirubinemia as Robbie predicted in aliquot one based on the pruritus. A little bit of alphos elevation, not much, but the AST and ALT are striking. So how do you approach AST and ALTs in the thousands? There is one other important clue here. The AST has a shorter half-life than the ALT. So when you see these ratios come close, close together, you just wonder, is whatever caused the insult, has it stopped causing the insult? And now you're seeing the ASC come down a little quicker and meet the ALT. The, the four most common causes of liver chemistry tests in the thousands of hepatocellular pattern includes viruses. And we've already talked about the hepatitis viruses, specifically hepatitis A, but you can also think about herpes viruses, HSV, VZV, CMV. These can all cause, you know, severe acute liver injury. By the way, this is severe acute liver injury. This is an acute liver failure. No coagulopathy, no encephalopathy, severe acute liver injury. So virus is number one. Two toxins, specifically Tylenol. I mean, I, I often wonder would Tylenol be FDA approved just given its toxicities or would they put more of a limit than four? I never say take up to four grams. Usually I'm at two grams with my patients. But in the toxins, you can look at her med list too and start Googling stuff. There's actually a specific formula called, called Hyde's law, like an equation that may be able to prioritize a toxin related severe acute liver injury, HY, DE, we learned it on a VMR a year ago, I believe. Mushrooms are another cause of severe acute liver injury that you have to consider. So viruses, toxins, ischemia. Remember that the, the liver has dual blood supply, hepatic artery, portal vein. So if you're gonna be ischemic, either you have severe hypotension, which this patient doesn't have, or you have post-hepatic obstruction in the hepatic vein or the IVC, as may occur in Bud Chiari. So it's gonna be important to know from Rafa whether there was Dopplers to see if the post liver was fine. But I think it was fine because usually patients with Bud Chiari will also have ascites and this patient didn't have any ascites. But you really wanna evaluate the flow of blood to the liver, out of the liver. The fourth most common cause which many of us don't consider and was shown in an article by Tony Brew that maybe a Drew or someone can put in the chat was cholidocal lithiasis. So past stones can cause AST and ALT to this degree. 
The important thing to remember is that you want to look at the dynamic nature of these AST and LT. So if it suddenly improves, then maybe it was a transient insult from a stone, a transient insult from hypotension, for example. You wouldn't expect viruses and toxins to suddenly improve, but they do improve when, the, when you remove the toxin exposure. So that's, that's all I have, honestly, for this aliquot, is that I want you to remember, just think about the liver parenchyma. Think about what goes into the liver, the blood vessels. Think about the biliary system going into the liver. So is it a blood perfusion issue pre-post? Is it a biliary tract obstruction? Is it a proper liver issue where you have viruses and toxins? That being said, Mike to my dear friend, Robbie. Just an absolutely brilliant walkthrough. Seriously, brilliant. I'm gonna try to at, try to incorporate the imaging findings, but first maybe I'll take the opportunity to summarize where we're at. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, give me one second. I'm just gonna share the screen real quick. <clears throat> okay. First step was it's not the carrots because the eyes were injected, were yellow. And then the next question, is it prehepatic with indirect hyperbilirubinemia? The cholestasis moved us here. And then we have no imaging findings to suggest that the lesion is here. And along with the fact that the AST and ALT are through the roof, we landed here because here does not cause an AST ALT through the roof. And the initial question right before the ALT, AST and ALT were revealed, well, is it hepatocellular cholestasis or is it primary duct disease like IgG4 disease or primary biliary cholangitis, or is it an infiltrative disease? The fact that the AST and ALT are this high moves us to a whole different schema as Reza outlined of acute liver failure injury. I just want to recap that journey. So jaundice, cholest cholestasis, lack of bildil, concomitant AST, ALT through the roof. We are now in the acute liver injury schema. Are we though? <gasps> I don't know, maybe. It sounds like the answer should be no based on how I'm asking it, but the honest answer is I don't know. I also have made my screen so big, I don't know where the stop screen button is. <laughs> Give me a moment. Oh, there it is. Okay, so what, are the, what about the imaging findings? Are we dealing with acute liver injury? The answer is, as Reza walked us through, hell yeah, of course we are. But what do we make of the fact that the liver is nodular and may indicate liver cirrhosis? My first fun fact about that is no other organ cirrhosis. So a liver cirrhosis is equal to cirrhosis as no other organ cirrhosis sizes. Um, but I think it's important to ask yourself, does this indicate acute liver injury on top of superimposed chronic liver disease? And the truth is the DDX of um, nodular, nodular contularity has many things, including cirrhosis, but this begs the question, are we dealing with acute on chronic liver disease? And if the answer is yes, we've made tremendous progress because there's only three diseases that cause acute on chronic liver disease with the AST and ALT still able to rise to this high. The most common cause of acute on chronic liver disease is alcohol, ex alcohol ex steatohepatitis on top of chronic alcohol disease, but that disease does not result in AST ALT this high. So if the acute dimension is this severe, there are three possible diseases. Hepatitis B with superimposed hepatitis D or reactivation of indolent hep B. Wilson's disease with chronic, chronic liver disease accompanied by acute liver failure or autoimmune hepatitis. And if you're going to pick between these three things, you have to worry about hepatitis B owing to the travel history. You have to worry about Wilson's disease owing to the young patient's age, but the gender of the patient and the, the subtle protein gap that she has would make you worry most at this point about autoimmune hepatitis. The truth is all causes of the schema are at play, but if you factor in the cirrhosis and believe it, which is an assumption, and you prioritize based on gender and protein gap, autoimmune hepatitis would be at the top, but everything else is still fair game. Most importantly, I'd say the drug history becomes key here. So in addition to everything else that we know causes liver injury, it's probably worth a close review of the medication section at this point. And I say that for two reasons. One, because I think it's important, but two, because um, the, the profoundness of yesterday's case from Amory still lingers today, in my head at least. All right, y'all, back to Rafa. Okay, so I'm going to give you all the information before the biopsy, okay? So HIV and acute hepatitis panel 
was negative. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin antibody was 199, which is in the upper limit, the normal going uh, until two, uh, 200. Uh, the serolo serolopasmine was 49, normal. The T spot TB was negative. Uh, the actin IgG antibody was 18. Actin IgG antibody uh, was 18, which is in the upper normal limit. The mitochondrial antibody was 11.5, which is normal. And the IgG was 2,508, which is high. The ANA pattern was homogeneous, and the ANA titer was 1 to 106. The ethanol and the salicylate level were both normal. And this acetaminophen level was also normal. And the TSH was 1.78, which is normal. And that's the end of the aliquot. Oh, juicy stuff. I am. Um... I'll just tell you what I know about the tests that are negative, and then actually I have Reza uh, reflect on the um, the data that are positive. Um, you know, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency is highly underdiagnosed. I'm really glad that we looked for it here, and um, it essentially is so good that it nearly rules out the disease. The same is true of seroplasmin, but unfortunately, a negative TB quantiferon does not rule out um, active tuberculosis. Um, it's always a good idea to look for drug-induced causes, but the drug levels are tricky because the drug may have vanished by the time the patient comes in. This is especially important for acetaminophen toxicity when somebody has taken acetaminophen four or five days ago and they come in with acute liver injury or failure today, you can't assume that a negative drug level means no disease. TSH is a great thought for um, hyperbilirubinemia, though um, I would say that the most common association with TSH and hyperbilirubinemia is indirect hyperbilirubinemia. It's frankly the only systemic disease absent hemolysis that causes a prominent hyperbilirubinemia, which is indirect. But there's some positivity on there, which I'll pass uh, the mic to Reza to reflect on. Folks, you see how great of a friend I have. <laughs> he, he predicted part of the diagnosis right away with um, the liver chemistry abnormalities and the imaging, which was just absolutely brilliant. And I, and I love when Robbie does that. Here, um, what's, what Robbie detected in that, in that aliquot that Ralph presented was that protein gap. And he said, I'm concerned for autoimmune hepatitis. So this patient has an elevated IgG level. This patient has a protein gap. This patient would meet the criteria for autoimmune hepatitis. Of course, I think this patient still needs a liver biopsy. And I'll explain why. There's one part that we haven't explained yet, and that's the... Uh, anti-mitochondrial antibody that's positive. That's right, Rafa, it was positive, correct? The AMA? Um, let me see here. No, it was normal, 11.5. It was normal, got it, okay. Mm -hmm. The only reason I asked that question is because you have to enter, like in a woman, pruritus, if the AMA was positive, you would worry about PBC. So that would put you in this overlap of autoimmune hepatitis and PBC, which can't happen. So I think that this data is highly suggestive of autoimmune hepatitis. And um, there was like a really good infographic that one of our members created. And I'll, I actually took a screenshot. I don't know if anyone has it and can share it in the chat. It was, I, I'm forgetting who created it, but it was really phenomenal. So that's sort of where I am in the land of autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, Robbie, I would, I would love to know if you're, if you're there with me, my friend. Always, my friend, always. So, so Rafa, um, the mic back to you, but actually let me see if I can do something real quick. Let me just share my screen. Uh, yes, let me share my screen one second. 
are you guys seeing this infographic right now of autoimmune hepatitis? Or is it still erythema abigne? Maria, which one are you seeing? Autoimmune hepatitis? Okay, great. All right, so this was created by, hopefully their name is on this schema. I don't, but anyways, here is the diagnosis. Um, if suspected, autoimmune hepatitis depends on four, four factors. Um, the ANA, auto, uh, ANA anti-smooth muscle antibody, some of these other antibodies, IgG elevation, which we have, and then a biopsy showing classic histologic findings and exclusion of other um, findings. And then here you can see what the management looks like. In any case, I'll search for this on Twitter so I can share it with you. I think it's a very good infographic. All right, I think Rafa, that's our final answer, my friend. Okay, so the liver biopsy showed a lymphoplasmacytic portal, inflammatory infiltrates, extending into the lobules, with hydropic change of hepatocytes. Oh my God, that's a tricky word. Empiripolase is present. I have no idea if I <laughs> said that correctly. And slight cholestase is noted. Uh, do you guys know the correct answer <laughs> based on the liver biops? Do you want to comment something? Yeah, I think it, you know, um, autoimmune hepatitis is a very tricky diagnosis and biopsy makes it much, much, much more confident. Um, and I think that's a good working diagnosis. You have to recognize that plasma cells can also be part of other diseases um, like IgG4 disease, which can mimic autoimmune hepatitis. But I think the case for autoimmune hepatitis is a really good one. So yeah, take us home. Yes, so it was autoimmune hepatitis. Um... Let me see. The tissue diagnosis attempted to be a liver biopsy, yield portal plasma cell rich inflammation with interface hepatitis, empiropolysis, and cholestasis consistent with autoimmune hepatitis. The patient was treated with high dose steroids, and the patient was seen in clinic shortly after, placed on, uh, on a steroid taper, and is currently on 10 milligrams per hour per genosome. And maintenance therapy will continue to prevent disease recurrence. And that's the end of the case. Such an intriguing case. I'll tell you that um, there's so much to learn here. And if you're trying to see, like, how do I, how do I even begin? If you if you if you started this case with your knowledge growing in this topic, which I'll tell you that I was not too long ago, two three years ago, I think I would found my the gap in my knowledge massive in this domain. And I think the first thing is not to learn and master autoimmune hepatitis, but to try to ask yourself, how do I even suspect it? And I think my reflection is to continue to think about how you can localize the lesion well. Because once you've localized the lesion, UpToDate is your friend, but UpToDate will not help you localize the lesion. That's where ProfRes and CP solvers come in, localize the lesion. So if you have somebody who's jaundiced, ask them if they have carrots and you don't need to if their eyes are yellow. And then is it direct or indirect? And resitatus, hepatomegaly, cholestasis, direct. And then direct hyperbilirubinemia is the same question with, with the kidney. Is it in the kidney or the liver itself, or is it in the plumbing? We use ultrasound for the kidney, and we don't know that very well. Use the ultrasound or imaging for the liver. And I think localizing it from jaundice to, to, to the liver itself, and then within the liver, using the ASTLT to prioritize hepatocellular injury is a real learning to take away from this case. And then you can start to understand the intricate details of autoimmune hepatitis. So that's my, that's my biggest reflection and takeaway if you're beginning to know this. But if you know that well, then yeah, go ahead and master autoimmune hepatitis. I think that's the, that would be the order in which I would want to do it. But Prof Rez, any final reflections before we pass the mic to Kiara? Zero. Zero. All right, Kiara, take us home. Hi friends, thank you so much Rafa for this amazing case. And, and we missed you so much Reza, we missed you last Friday. Um, so we start with a non very specific chief complaint which was fatigue and Reza told us that if we have fatigue, let's wait until there are more associated symptoms to like uh, narrow the diagnosis. Um, in this case also this patient was a female, a young adult. So the age many times can help us to narrow the diagnosis too. 
This was a female with pruritus and itching. And we have uh, more, we, we have to think first uh, about common pathologies affecting the skin. So primary skin pathologies are the most common causes of pruritus or itching. So we can have like dry skin, eczema, scabies. Uh, this also can go with some secondary changes due to itching or any other processes. Um, however, there are also some systemic diseases that, that can lead to pruritus, like in this case, uh, well, not in this case, but can be renal diseases, cholestasis, uh, neoplasia, uh, not, uh, or exactly lymphoma, or thyroid diseases. We had that this patient had a yellow pigment in her eyes, so that translated to bilirubin. And when we have bilirubin, we need to think if first if it is uh, direct or indirect. And then we can, with that, help localize if it is pre or hepatic or post hepatic um, uh, causes, uh, maybe with some uh, labs, additional labs, and with the clinic too. So this is very important because as like I think that the conclusion of the day is that we have to localize the lesion and then we can we can <laughs> be helped with some other sources, right? So uh, this this patient uh, seemed to have uh, cholestasis and cholestasis can be uh, we, we also had the information that this patient had a prior gallbladder gallbladder surgery. But uh, gallbladder surgery does not rule out that she has no more stones or no more any problems like this. So they, there can be some uh, stone, re remnant stone on it on, or any other disease. So surgery is not the solution for everything. Um, so other, so other possible causes uh, for cholestasis can be parasites. In Peru, we have many, many parasites causing cholestasis. Uh, medications endemic uh, that can be a cause of intrahepatic cholestasis, hep A, prolonged, uh, hep A if this is a prolonged ca cause, then I, and primary sclerosis cholangitis. Uh, about hepatomegaly, we can have hepatomegaly uh, with due to congestion like heart failure or some inflammation like viral hepatitis that we were thinking about that because of this patient prior history. But with uh, viral hepatitis, especially in hepatitis A, we can um, we we can have like some remnant hepatitis, but this is most likely like six months after Hep A, not that long. Um, so then another cause of hepatomegaly are infiltrative processes like granulomatous diseases. In granulomatous diseases, we can. Uh, we can localize or we can think about like granulomatous diseases can affect the skin like Bartonella or sporotrichosis, lung like mycobacteria, nocardia or amyloidosis, GI like Brucella, Salmonella or mycobacterium bovis, GEU like bladder cancer or some lymphogranuloma venerum and endemic mycosis. Another thing very important that helped lead us to, to have the diagnosis of acute liver injury was that uh, AL, ALT and ASC were very, very, very elevated. So um, some hepatocellular acute patterns can be Hep A, Hep B, HPV, CNB, herpes. Also can be caused by toxins like Tylenol, mushrooms. I think it's called Aman, Amanti, Amantia. I forgot the name. Ischemia. Uh, we can have acu acute liver failure due to ischemia. For example, we can think when this, we have severe hypotension or some post-hepatic obstruction and colloidal colitis. Um, well, finally, we have to think about if this was an acute liver injury versus an acute on chronic liver diseases. One common cause of, of acute on chronic liver diseases was alcohol, but this was not the case. Um, finally, when we have a pattern like women women with jaundice and AMM, AM, AMM positive, we have to think about primary biliary cholangitis, but this was not the case. And well, this was a case of autoimmune hepatitis. And I, I learned so, so much today because we had like a, a very big social history. I was thinking about some, something from her recent travel or something about his, her past medical history or medications. So this was like, a great, great case and great discussion. Thank you, friends.
Kiara, that was phenomenal. I, you know, I can listen to you teach for, for hours. Mm. Thank you so much for that excellent summary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And Vale, nice job subscribing. You crushed it. That was really, really well done. Thank you, guys. Thank All right, y'all. See you later. Bye, guys.